Do most people really believe that God values define us as a people? Are we really following the ways of God? Or are we creating God to follow our ways? And then, then the indivisible. I mean, isn't it obvious that we're a very divided culture, a very divided nation? Um, how come racism is alive and well? How come LGBT people are treated with such, such suspicion by so many people? How come Muslims experience so much prejudice? In this morning's uh, Sacramento Bee, there are a couple of stories from uh, our mayor telling how the police have responded to him as an individual. When an African-American guy is driving a black Porsche, the assumption is that he's stolen it. Not that he's the mayor of Sacramento. <laughs> Uh, one nation under God, indivisible. Um, and by the way, you do realize that the under God language was added in 1954 in response to the McCarthy stuff. We were worried about godless communists like Paul Robeson. A, a nation that lives under God isn't so much concerned about excluding people, but rather celebrating the notion of God's shalom. Uh, God's shalom is a state of well-being for everybody, every child, every woman, every man. Nobody goes to bed hungry without home or health care. Everyone knows that they are loved. That's what it means to say one nation under God, yes? Isn't that right? Isn't that right? Yes. Yeah, thank you, thank you. And then this um, liberty and justice for all. Um, Mark, as one who's active in the legal system, is there liberty and justice for all? Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got a problem here. Um, I, I really believe in liberty and justice for all, and all really does mean all. <laughs> but apparently it, it doesn't. So. When we say the Pledge of Allegiance, it's a real challenge to us to engage the God of liberation who sets us free as a people so that we can find what's God's purpose for us and the way in which we can all be precious in God's sight and precious God's children. By the way, the Pledge of Allegiance was written by a Baptist minister. I didn't know until I went researching it and reflecting for this sermon. A man called Francis Bellamy, he also happened to be a Christian socialist. We're not allowed to say that word these days. Um, he deliberately used the word liberty. He wanted to put the word equality with equality and justice for all um, and realized that that wouldn't get past his school board in, in a segregated community. Um, but don't we know better? Liberty and justice for all really does mean all people. Ours is a God who believes in liberating all people so that not just American children, but every child of the planet can experience what it means to be fully human and fully alive as a child of God. Ours is a God of liberation who insists on freedom and dignity for everyone. And the story tells us that people who are liberated are constantly questioning whether it's real and it can be trusted. Repeatedly, the children of Israel wander in the desert and keep questioning Moses and his leadership. They even question whether Moses dialed the right number when he was talking to God. Was it really God who was talking to him? Over and over again, this liberation process felt uncomfortable because it felt new and it felt different. And people weren't sure, really, whether they liked being liberated. In the 50s and 60s in Latin America, a movement stood in the Catholic Church questioning why so many people were destined to live in poverty. Priests and others were having a profound moral reaction to the effects of poverty on millions of people's lives, while others lived nearby in extraordinary opulence. It was the Peruvian priest Gustavo Gutierrez who coined the expression liberation theology. And Latin American liberation theology soon gave rise to lots of other liberation theologies around the world in Southeast Asia and uh, African American uh, liberation theology, women's liberation theology in the United States. 
lots of liberation theologies. Uh, by 1983, it was our good friend Cardinal Ratzinger, um, who of course became Pope Benedict, who denounced Gutierrez and the other liberation writers as Marxists and antagonists of the hierarchical church. All right? So they were in, the liberation people were in trouble because they were resisting the authority of the church. But voices like Ratzinger's are closing the stable door long after the horse has left. It's clear to many Christians around the world that the central teaching of Jesus is that we're bringing good news to poor people. Any theology that fails to provide such gospel that it's only good news for the wealthy and the powerful, well, that clearly was not the intent of Jesus. So yes, the Exodus story reminds us that God has a political agenda, which is really a simple moral agenda of enabling every child of the planet to realize their own potential without fear or oppression. Social reform is central, and the humbling of power politicians is an inevitable result. Interesting to see uh, the, the text speaking about God hardening Pharaoh's heart, uh, making him stubborn. Did you notice that? But there is a more personal side to this understanding of God as liberator. So I ask you today about what inhibits or imprisons or enslaves you. For some people it's obvious, it's maybe a drinking problem or an addiction to something, prescription drugs, gambling, whatever. For others the addictions are, are, are less obvious. Maybe for some people there is a fear or a shyness that prevents them from engaging people and the world at their point of need. A good question to ask yourself is something like this. Given that the life of faith is a journey, a constant process of growth, what is the next step I need to take in my own personal growth? Where is God liberating me the next step? How can I move forward just one step in my life of faith? Where is my promised land? What does it look like? Where am I headed? For the African slaves, there was a blending of the notion of freedom to live a godly life with the notion of escaping from slavery to freedom. They longed for that day, and they cloaked their longing for freedom in spiritual language. Many of the spirituals, as you know, contain within them references to escape routes, and especially to the Underground Railroad. Uh, spirituals such as follow the drinking gourd very explicitly, and I couldn't hear nobody pray. If you go through the actual words of it, you'll find that it's, a, it's giving directions. But a, a favorite of mine could refer to escaping to the north, to Canada, or simply sneaking out of the master's house at night to go to the Methodist camp meeting in the local forest. Or it could be a song of liberation for each of us, right here, now, or in the days to come. It says, Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay here. My Lord, he calls me. He calls me by the thunder, the trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to say. He calls me by the lightning, 
The trumpet sounds within my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Steal away, steal away, steal away to Jesus. Steal away, steal away. amazing when the God of liberation is at work. Anything can happen. And when I say anything, I mean anything. Amen.